experience of this uh, of this uh, the, of the current course, and today we have uh, we had the opportunity because of this uh, link between this conference and this cycle of having <coughs> one of the most eminent researchers in this nonlinear optic fiber optics field. So for me, it's really a pleasure to have here uh, Professor Barnitz, who I didn't know personally. I know many of his papers. And uh, uh, Professor Vapnitz, I think, is remarkable that he's currently in the University of Rome, but he's been professor in other places, right? You were professor at Brescia, right? right. And also at Dijon, uh, right. Bourgogne. But what was more <laughs> remarkable for me was that you also had some career outside the academics, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you were also in some companies uh, doing technical uh, assessment there which somehow is telling you that, um, telling you both, all of you, that it's a very nice combination of, you know, s academy and applications in a field in which you could see that it's related to something which is very applied, but you can also do very interesting physics in, in it. Um, his background is engineering, right? Yeah. So you'll see that uh, you can do many things no matter if you are a physicist, mathematician, or engineer, or so if you are good enough. So I just want to just uh, give him the floor to start with uh, this conference that I will hope it will be, and I'm sure it will be very interesting for all of you. Okay, thank you very much. So we can uh, start. Go ahead, please. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a kind introduction, and uh, in, in particular to the student chapter for organizing uh, the entire event and uh, being in contact for uh, several months uh, for all the details of uh, the organization of this interesting uh, school. Well, a school uh, event uh, aimed at uh, young researchers. Um, so I, I encourage you to uh, I am a little bit uncertain about, uh, you, uh, there is probably a different uh, level of expertise uh, among uh, the audience, uh, the, the young researchers uh, who are here. Uh, so I, I encourage you to even, uh, uh, maybe it's a little bit difficult, time is short, but if you have uh, uh, questions, uh, maybe even uh, better to interrupt, uh, to ask uh, questions right away, rather than waiting until the end. So that's always... Uh, uh, what I pr unfortunately it happens rarely in uh, lectures uh, that the students have the courage to interrupt uh, but uh, that is uh, the most constructive approach uh, uh, if there is a uh, it's not just a unidirectional uh, message but it is uh, the, the exchange is bidirectional even uh, du during the exposition and not only waiting for the for the uh, question and answers uh, part of the of the talk so that is uh, uh, the general title, as it was mentioned, is Nolina Multimode Fiber Optics. And uh, actually the subtitle uh, uh, of this presentation is uh, from uh, uh, wave thermalization to extreme nonlinear optics. Uh, so it's really focused on uh, uh, some physical uh, and uh, aspects and, and new uh, uh, vision and uh, results that we have obtained in uh, in our group in the uh, Sapienza University of Rome over the last uh, five years. So we, get, we got started exactly in 2019, and it's a new lab. And uh, I would like to mention my uh, young co-workers, Ferraro, Mangini, Pararivas, uh, San, and Zitelli. And uh, that's where we are, in a beautiful place. I think you, you can recognize uh, uh, this building from the Gladiator <laughs> movie. So that is uh, our uh, faculty is uh, uh, located in uh, the, what it is, uh, it was the monastery of the church of St. Peter in Chains, uh, which is just next door. So that is the, the cluster, the courtyard of our uh, engineering university, which is off the main campus of Sapienza. And uh, uh, our nonlinear photonics lab uh, was established uh, five years ago, uh, thanks uh, to a grant by the European uh, Research Council, an advanced grant uh, on exactly this topic of uh, uh, complexity and uh, multi-mode uh, optics as a test bed for studying complexity 
in, uh, in physics and in, uh, uh, in uh, nonlinear waves. So these are, are pictures of uh, when uh, the our uh, femtosecond laser uh, platform and optical table were carried out, uh, were, were mounted in our lab exactly five years ago. Oh, sorry. So here is an outline, and I would like to mention that, in fact, uh, this, is, um, this presentation uh, turns out uh, to be uh, a tutorial talk that I presented at the last uh, Clio Europe uh, in Munich. Uh, so it is a tutorial, so it is intended to be uh, presented uh, as an introduction to the field. Uh, so I will, uh, what I my focus will be to really expose you to uh, some uh, ideas and, uh, and concepts and maybe inspire uh, uh, new developments, new directions, uh, without going too deep into the details, which uh, uh, any, any of you who is interested can, uh, can explore uh, by looking at the papers. So the, the I would like to introduce multi-mode nonlinear fibers, why we are interested uh, to study them and what's the difference with respect to single-mode fibers. Uh, there are two types of uh, uh, telecom or conventional multi-mode fibers. There are many specialty optical fibers like microstructure fibers, hollow core fibers, uh, and so on, uh, which I will not have time to talk about. What is interesting is that, in fact, these are commercial fibers, uh, step index or graded index fibers that have been or developed already before single mode fibers, already in the 70s, when uh, fiber optics, uh, all, I, uh, all business of uh, fiber optics for communication started. So I will uh, motivate and then I will introduce, uh, so that's uh, all, the, all the stuff, but then there is a new diagram that we have, uh, I would like to present, which is introducing to really new concepts that we have uh, somehow uh, discovered from the practice of our lab. So it was not something that we had uh, an idea that all these things will happen, but actually uh, we observed them and uh, we understood them uh, on the way, thanks uh, to young people, young researchers and their imagination. So there are two, in fact, the two main regimes, weak nonlinearity, where nonlinearity is relatively weak, is a perturbation with respect to uh, the guiding structure of fibers. And there are two, a couple of effects that I would like to present. Multi-mode solitons, which is a generalization of optical solitons in uh, single-mode fibers, which uh, uh, just celebrated the 50 years anniversary last year. Uh, from the prediction by Asagawa. Uh, and then another effect which is relatively new and uh, which is uh, actually the one that uh, motivated, that gave the birth, uh, I mean, uh, for this uh, advanced grant, uh, that is the beam self-cleaning effect uh, in uh, uh, multi-mode fibers. It's a very surprising effect. And uh, a new thermodynamic theory has been developed uh, also in collaboration with uh, co other people uh, in France and in the United States, and uh, which uh, uh, sort of explains, even though not explains everything, but it gives uh, uh, at least uh, a good uh, prediction that is confirmed by our experiment, even though there are still uh, open questions that I will not have time to, uh, to discuss today. And then there is a whole another, uh, let's say, uh, playground, which is uh, uh, on, uh, on another uh, scale of uh, optical powers that we call extreme nonlinear optics in multimode opti optical fibers, that is when the power uh, uh, grows uh, so high when you approach the damage threshold of the fiber and uh, some uh, beautiful effects like uh, uh, generation of a s rainbow spiral from the fiber, helical plasma filaments. So we observe uh, plasma filaments that typically are observed by uh, powerful laser beams in air. We can observe them in, in fibers and also some surprising effects. I mean, fibers, uh, they are known for being transparent, uh, so they have a very, very low loss, and that's why we can use them for the uh, backbone of the uh, internet, uh, hi uh, let's say, highway of the information highway. But in fact, uh, those very high powers, uh, then there are, uh, they become, uh, there is no linear absorption effects, like multi-photon absorption, which is induced by very small defects in the fiber, uh, and uh, that leads uh, to up conversion uh, of light, uh, which leads to luminescence. Uh, so we are able actually to see the beam of light uh, by this luminescence that is scattered out of the fiber. So it's a whole new regime uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, nobody studied before, that you only, uh, only occurs at very high power levels. And then I will conclude. So what is the difference uh, for, uh, for starters between single mode and multi-mode fibers? Well, there is a very simple difference from, you know, 
uh, undergraduate stu stud students uh, simply the size uh, is, uh, of the core is bigger, which means that we for many we can understand the behavior of single mode fibers uh, or multi mode fibers by just uh, uh, ray optics approach. We have many rays that can propagate, uh, but then there is a a big difference from the point of view of the application. Uh, well, when you have many of these rays that can propagate, uh, then at the output you get uh, a speckled out of output beam. So all these uh, rays and all these modes, they have different, uh, different uh, phase velocities and group velocities. So just thinking in the spatial domain, they will interfere and, uh, and uh, the interference patterns changes completely. So this is just uh, the interference pattern of the, uh, the near field at the output of the fiber. Uh, you just touch the fiber and all these speckles move around. So it uh, looks, uh, looks chaotic. Of course, it's fully deterministic because all the depends on the relative phase shift between the modes. But so you, you cannot transport images. You cannot transport spatial information. You have to use uh, some tricks uh, like uh, uh, spatial light modulators uh, and some uh, genetic approach or uh, phase conjugation to, to correct for this uh, di spatial distortion. Whereas uh, single mode fibers, well, they have a single mode. So the beam comes out as clean, a Gaussian beam comes out, which is uh, similar to the one of your, uh, your laser. Uh, so the, the spatial coherence is, uh, uh, by definition, I mean, the beam quality is, is perfect. It's clo as close as possible to a Gaussian beam that propagates in free space. So that, is, uh, that explains the success of single mode fibers uh, for, uh, for all the applications so far, and they've been used uh, for 99.9 uh, uh, .9 of, uh, of uh, systems and applications. And um, uh, again, now going into multi-mode optical fibers, uh, there are two varieties. So first of all, there are two types of fibers, uh, multi-mode and single mode, that's easy. Then about uh, multi-mode fibers, there are two types. Uh, there is a standard uh, step index fiber, which is uh, just a uh, single mode fiber, bigger one. Uh, and uh, you see that in this case, for the step index fiber, what I show for the different modes, uh, uh, sorry, how the, uh, the different uh, group velo I mean, uh, phase velocity is, uh, is changing, and you see that uh, they have uh, no regular spacing between the modes. These are the red dots. Whereas uh, if you make the parabolic, uh, the, the index profile looking uh, par uh, to a parabola, a truncated parabola, then is a graded index fiber, which uh, to first order, uh, enables you to suppress modal dispersion, so the modal dispersion is much, uh, much smaller for this uh, graded index fiber, but they, they have uh, a particular property which is very important, uh, that all modes uh, are grouped by families of uh, degenerate modes, so nearly degenerate, so you and uh, the spacing between uh, each family is constant. So they all these modes have uh, equispaced uh, phase velocities, uh, which is uh, so an in, uh, something to remember for the following. And then there are other multi-mode fibers like multi-core, photonic crystal, holocore, and so on. But uh, we will, uh, um, essentially, we will, uh, almost in everything that I will present today, uh, I will talk about graded index uh, multi-mode fibers. So this is just uh, uh, to show how, uh, for the, the two different uh, types of uh, refractive index profiles, how the mode uh, look like. So you can study the mode profiles and you, you, uh, something that you can notice immediately that fundamental mode uh, for the step index fiber is very broad uh, so the nonlinear uh, because it's uh, not so confined that uh, the nonlinear coefficient will be relatively low even lower than the nonlinear coefficient for higher order modes whereas uh, for the graded index fiber uh, the, the fundamental mode is very well confined and uh, that is the effective uh, area is small and the nonlinear coefficient will be high so it will be the dominant one Okay, and then uh, wha again, what is the mo uh, coming to the motivation? Why there is uh, so much interest in the community about multi-mode fibers? Well, uh, the first uh, uh, motivation comes clearly from the internet uh, capacity crunch, uh, the bottleneck to the capacity of uh, our uh, communication, uh, fiber optic communication lines. So the only way uh, to effectively increase the capacity of optical communication systems is the space division multiplexing. And uh, using multi-mode fibers is a special type uh, of um, spatial division multiplexing, which involves mode division multiplexing. So each uh, you can just uh, use one fiber, and if you have a multi, the key is of course to develop all the zoo of components uh, that go around. For example, a multi-mode 
uh, optical amplifier that is able to amplify all the modes with e equal gains. So, but in any case, this uh, uh, is an effective way to, to multiply. If you have a, a multi-mode optical fiber with M mode, you multiply the capacity by M times. Whereas if you just increase the nonlinearity, you increase the capacity by the logarithm of the increase of power, which is goes much, uh, much slower. And then you, uh, so nonlinear effects will limit you in any case. So that is the, uh, really the emerging approach, uh, especially for uh, uh, submarine uh, intercontinental links. Uh, another uh, uh, important application is that uh, if you make the fiber bigger and multi-mode, then uh, you can uh, substantially increase the energy delivered by uh, femtosecond lasers, both uh, continuous wave and also mod-locked uh, femtosecond lasers. So for, uh, for many high-power applications uh, uh, that we have today, and we know that the fiber lasers are uh, widely used. They've replaced almost all other lasers in uh, industrial applications for, uh, from micro-machining to uh, cutting metals and so on. So that is, uh, uh, and, and having stable and more uh, uh, powerful uh, fiber lasers is, uh, is a really big, uh, big uh, challenge. And then uh, there is a motivation from a fundamental point of view, uh, uh, which is the one actually that motivated my grant, is that uh, you can have a, a b virtually in inexpensive uh, for free because uh, graded in this, these are standard fibers, so they cost uh, $1 per meter. They are not uh, expensive uh, hollow core fibers that cost thousands of dollars per meter. Uh, and uh, so you can study light complexity using this uh, uh, basically for free test bed. You can study multi-mode solitons, spatial temporal mode locking, uh, super continuum, multi-mode spectral broadening, so super generation of uh, sidebands over uh, from ranging from the visible to the mid-infrared, and the special, special beam self-cleaning. So I will uh, say something about uh, these first two effects, these, these two effects. But first, before going that, uh, into that, I will give this uh, slide of the perspective of the entire uh, game that we are playing uh, uh, that involves the nonlinear effects. So what, uh, what nonlinearity is, is that you introduce uh, a nonlinear polarization which modifies the material properties with light. And uh, of course, we don't have any quadratic uh, polarization in fibers. We have only the cubic one, the Kerr effect, or Raman or harmonic generation, uh, supercontinuum and uh, sideband generations. And all these effects are effects which occur, so in initially uh, in this plot what you have the input power and the output power. So initially you, you increase the output power, you increase the input power and the uh, output power increases uh, linearly. And then in the nonlinear regime you start to have a bending but still is fully reversible. So if you go down uh, you, you don't follow, you don't have any hysteresis behavior. So you go, you increase the power, you go along this line, you decrease the power, you go down along the same line. And uh, so the, the first part of the talk, I will talk about effects in this reversible domain and like a self-cleaning. So you see that the beam uh, shape uh, changes uh, the output with power in a dramatic way. Uh, you go from speckles to almost uh, a clean beam and also multimode solitons belong uh, to, the, to this range. Uh, and then there is a, uh, a new window that opens here between uh, what, is what is hard breakdown is uh, essentially you have breakdown of the fiber. The transmission drops to zero. You are destroying the fiber and you create permanent defects by light. So there is an, a window that has been uh, virtually unexplored so far that we are studying in our lab where there are many beautiful uh, effects like generation of uh, conical or spiral waves, uh, uh, plasma filaments and so on. So I'll and we call it uh, extreme uh, soft breakdown uh, uh, type of, uh, of regime. So I'll just essentially try to, to show some uh, examples uh, at the end of the talk. So now, giving the starting with the weak nonlinearity regime, what is the framework to study uh, um, the classical framework, I mean, uh, to study nonlinear effects. Uh, the fr classical framework is, uh, is always based on the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is the same equation that holds for single mode fibers. Uh, uh, you expand the field uh, on the mode basis, and the modes are the linear modes. That's why we it's, a linea it's a weak regime. Nonlinearity doesn't modify the modes, but only affects uh, the, the slowly varying envelope over a length scale, which is relatively long of the order of the dispersion length and of the order of the nonlinear length that can go from uh, meters to kilometers uh, 
depending on the power level. Uh, and the you get, uh, so there is a so somehow a straightforward extension of the single mode case. You have now, instead of a single equation, when you have the interplay between uh, dispersion and nonlinearity, so these two terms in the nonlinear evolution equation are uh, the first term describes chromatic dispersion and also now modal dispersion because all modes have different group velocity. And the second term describes nonlinearity. And uh, nonlinearity here is a self phase modulation and four way mixing. Okay, so these are uh, complex terms, but uh, again, it's uh, just uh, a vector extension of the single mode uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation uh, case. The, the what is the problem that I anticipate here is that uh, in this nonlinear term, you see you have uh, uh, the four way mixing, the multiplication between uh, uh, three fields uh, with uh, all these indexes running. So it's okay if you have a few modes, uh, you can compute this, but as long as uh, these, uh, these uh, fibers that we use in the experiments, they have 100 or modes. So uh, then uh, the number of uh, terms that you, ta that you have here goes with the cube of the number of modes. So it's a huge number of terms and it becomes, after 10, 15 modes, uh, it's almost impossible to solve, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, needs, it needs months to solve this equation. So that is uh, a real uh, pra practical uh, drawback uh, uh, to use the, this uh, simple and classical uh, extension uh, of the single mode approach for multimode optics is just very complex and very time consuming, even with modern computers. So some uh, 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 introduction to the concept of multimode soliton. So in the linear regime, uh, li in linear beam propagation in green fibers, for example, you have three modes. Uh, and uh, when you have a short pulse, uh, essentially the strongest effect is modal dispersion. What does it mean? It means that uh, you see pulse, you have initially superposition, you send all, uh, uh, all the, you couple your power in, uh, in three modes equally, then they split in time. See, the pulses move away from each other because the each, each mode uh, propagates with a different group velocity. So you have a, a, a spreading in time, uh, which is known as modal dispersion. Of course, if the pulse is very long uh, compared to this uh, uh, modal dispersion. Then, on the other hand, uh, so you can neglect the modal dispersion simply because you have a much longer time scale. And in this case, uh, you have a periodic breathing, a periodic evolution that is called the self-imaging of the beam that is due exactly to the fact uh, that uh, all the, the phase velocities are equally spaced. It's like a Fourier series. If you sum a Fourier series, you have a, a periodic signal. And the same here, you, uh, you have a beam that you inject, and this periodically is reproduced uh, along the fiber. And uh, so you get an image, uh, period that, that's why it's called the self-imaging. You, you image yourself uh, after a period which, is, uh, which has a, a, a length scale of a less than a millimeter, half of, milli of a millimeter, typically. Uh, this is in the linear regime. In the nonlinear regime, uh, what happens is that, uh, thanks to the Kerr effect, uh, uh, all these modes lock together. So there is a, a, a mode locking effect in time. So nonlinearity, essentially what it does is shift the frequency of all modes so that uh, uh, this, uh, this in order that uh, the, the, the frequency of the modes is shifted so that uh, thanks to group velocity dispersion, uh, they prop the, the group velocity dispersion uh, uh, induces a, uh, a velocity shift, which is exactly equal and opposite to the, group velo the, to the velocity shift uh, given by the modal dispersion. So nonlinearity shifts the frequency so that uh, essentially all the magically all the modes are now propagate uh, together, stay together. So uh, that, that is uh, the essence of this multi-mode soliton, at least in principle, it works very well. So you can compensate at the same time chromatic dispersion and modal dispersion. And, uh, and uh, you have a beautiful uh, self-imaging effect also for solitons. Yeah, is it uh, that uh, that looks very good on paper, but in fact, in the first experiment, when the, uh, by Reining and Wise, where they have studied these multimode solitons, they were a little bit cheating because they actually sent 90% of uh, the input uh, beam into the fundamental mode. So that's very easy. Uh, that the other two modes, the other few modes that were excited, I mean, were trapped by the fundamental just because uh, the fundamental mode had all the energy, so it was naturally trapped in them. So when you actually spread uh, the information over many modes, uh, this uh, trapping condition is very unstable and almost uh, uh, non-feasible in practice. Uh, unless, uh, sorry for the complexity of this regime, uh, uh, of this, of this uh, slide is very complex, but I'll just uh, try to explain the essence uh, that uh, there is a, sp a special case where multi-mode fiber solitons uh, 
are for real. And uh, there's again, what, what is the difficulty? The difficulty is that you have to compensate at the same time uh, chromatic dispersion, which is typically occurs over a very long scale, and the modal dispersion, which is much stronger, so which occurs over a short time scale. So uh, how can you compare um, comp and uh, do you want to compensate both effects with the same uh, effect, which is the care effect, which occurs over the nonlinear uh, length scale? So you cannot compensate the two effects which have a very different uh, uh, length scales. Chromatic dispersion, long length scale, uh, uh, modal dispersion, short length scale. But if, if there is a some pulse, uh, some regime where the two length scales become comparable, then it's obvious that you can compensate them by nonlinearity because nonlinear length must be equal to chromatic this to the dispersion length and to the modal dispersion length. Chromatic dispersion length and modal dispersion length. So when the two modal and chromatic dispersion lengths are equal, then you can compensate them with the nonlinearity. If, of course, the power is such that the nonlinear length is equal to the other two lengths. And this occurs uh, only in the femtosecond regime. Why is that? Well, because the walk of the distance uh, scales uh, linearly with the pulse width, whereas the dispersion length scales with the square of the, the, of the time width of the pulse width, right? So if the pulse, uh, no, in the picosecond regime, uh, this dispersion length is very big, much bigger than the, the walk-off length. But if you decrease the pulse duration, you see it decreases with the square of the pulse du duration. So the di for in the femtosecond regime, this dispersion length uh, goes down because it goes uh, uh, down with the square of the pulse duration. And it can actually become equal to the walk-off length. So the two the dispersion, I mean, uh, the Modal dispersion length and chromatic dispersion length actually equalize uh, in, in around 100 femtoseconds. So that is the magic number. And uh, if this is true, then the, there is, a, you see, you equate the two dispersion distances, and this means that T0 is unique, is fixed. So the, uh, there is only one uh, specific du temporal duration for a multi-mode soliton, as opposed to single-mode solitons where, uh, again, uh, you can always have uh, any duration, arbitrary duration of the pulse, uh, dura uh, the of the pulse uh, because it's enough you change the power. Uh, you change the duration of the pulse, you change the dispersion length, but then you change the linear length by increasing the power. And but here again, the pulse duration, uh, if you want to have the two dispersion lengths, uh, modal, uh, chromatic dispersion and modal dispersion length equal, uh, uh, then there is only one pulse duration which is determined only by the, uh, the linear dispersive properties of the fiber. And uh, of course it changes with wavelength. It doesn't change with power, uh, but only changes with wavelength uh, and is around 100 femtoseconds in the telecom range. Okay, so that uh, there is a sweet uh, region of uh, pulse durations where these multimode solitons are for real. And in fact, if you send a pulse uh, of very different input uh, pulse width in the fiber, and uh, you always uh, get uh, a soliton of, this of a fixed uh, pulse duration, so you, can you send 240 or 70 femtoseconds in the input, you always get 100 femtoseconds in the output, because the pulse duration is fixed by this relation. So that is uh, just an, o an overview of this, uh, 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 of this effect of the, uh, of the locking of, uh, of the modes uh, uh, which occurs uh, in... Uh in this regime. Again, uh, this, uh, in reality, there are other uh, nonlinear effects like Raman scattering, which occur over a, a longer distance, and this Raman scattering leads uh, to uh, uh, energy transfer between the modes, the different modes, uh, which eventually disrupt this beautiful multi-mode soliton, and then uh, uh, all the energy is, is uh, transferred to the fundamental soliton. So at the, at the end of a very long fiber of a kilometer length, you, uh, you end up with a, uh, with a soliton only in the fundamental mode. So for a while, uh, you create uh, this beautiful multi-mode superposition uh, soliton, but then eventually it is unstable and uh, it decays into the fundamental mode because of the Raman effect. Now I'll move uh, to the second uh, uh, surprising and uh, the uh, effect which only occurs in multi-mode fibers. There is no analog uh, by definition in single-mode fiber, uh, which is the special beam self-cleaning. So the surprising observation is that uh, uh, now there is no time, it's just a special effect. At low powers you have uh, speckles, so the, the intensity profile looks chaotic because of multi-mode interference. You increase the power and magically all the energy is recombined uh, and you get a clean spot at the center of the fiber, very close to the fundamental mode. But in fact, it's not only the fundamental mode. You see always uh, some energy 
in the higher order modes. So it's actually a, a mode distribution that is created. And uh, it occurs above a certain power threshold and is due to the care effect. Uh, and so you, you, and it's very stable. What is amazing is that you, you squeeze the fiber and in the linear regime, uh, all the speckles move around, but uh, uh, you, you move the fiber around and this pattern doesn't change at all. So it has, uh, uh, it has uh, some interesting applications uh, and it has been studied uh, from uh, uh, with pulse duration from nanoseconds to femtoseconds uh, in active fibers, in tapered fibers, in few mode fibers uh, by, by many groups and it has been reproduced. But, uh, uh, and also it has application for multi-mode fiber lasers because you can, uh, you can make a multi-mode uh, fiber laser so with high energy because the fiber is, is uh, thick, is multi-mode uh, but uh, with a clean uh, beam, uh, uh, beam quality at the output which is essential. For many applications, you need a clean beam uh, with a high M square parameter, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and if, you exp if you exploit uh, this uh, self-cleaning effect in the multi-mode fiber, which you insert in the, in the, in the loop uh, uh, of your laser, then uh, uh, you, can, uh, you win because you preserve the beam quality and you increase uh, by orders of magnitude your uh, pulse energy. So it has applications, uh, we demonstrated applications for uh, uh, high resolution uh, multi-photon imaging in microscopy and endoscopy using this, uh, this effect, you know. I mean uh, this is a self-cleaning. So uh, what I want to do is uh, just uh, uh, to, to outline one picture which is completely alternative uh, uh, to the classical one based on the coupled uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equations to explain uh, this effect and to reproduce it. Uh, which is uh, in fact uh, has nothing to do with nonlinear optics but just on statistical mechanics. So the theoretical description of this effect uh, is that uh, beam self-cleaning can be described as a, a process of thermalization of a nonlinear multi-mode wave. So essentially the, the photons in different modes are like uh, uh, particles uh, of a gas in a box, in different regions of a box. So you can uh, compute uh, the um, the number of configurations, the number of ways uh, in which you can uh, set uh, N1 uh, photons in mode 1, N2 photons in mode 2, N3 photons in mode 3. Uh, all these photos are indistinguishable and you can compute all, all the combinations. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh. So that is the, uh, and the GI is uh, the number of, uh, the degeneracy of, each, uh, degeneracy of each group of modes. So I is the index of a group of modes which have uh, uh, G modes, which has uh, GI modes uh, with the same uh, propagation constant. So GI is the degenerate. So you can compute uh, this uh, W, and uh, then uh, you uh, maximize the Boltzmann entropy. So you maximize the number of configurations, and if you do this by uh, maximization with the two constraints, uh, which are the conservation laws which uh, has to be have to be obeyed, that is the number of, because it's a conservative system, there is no dissipation, so the power is conserved and also the internal energy is conserved, the Hamiltonian. So by imposing these two conservations, you get an equation of state like in a gas, in a classical gas, uh, which relates them to two parameters which are the chemical potential and the temperature. Again, these are two effective uh, parameters that describe uh, the optical thermodynamics. It has nothing to do with the, with the temperature that we can measure on with the thermometer. We can measure it, the temperature, based on the, the equilibrium distribution, which is the famous rayleigh gins distribution. So it essentially tells uh, uh, this, the, this formula, which is very simple, it tells in each group of modes, uh, you divide the total number of photons by the degeneracy, and you have uh, these two parameters which depend on uh, mu and t, uh, and they depend also on the, on the propagation constant of that group. Uh, so it, uh, this is a relations distribution which tells you what is the equilibrium distribution. And what is the meaning of this uh, equilibrium distribution? When you maximize the entropy, essentially you, you determine the um, the most likely configuration of your system, the one, the configuration that is most disordered, okay, which is the uh, most likely one to appear. And uh, where is uh, uh, no linearity entered? There is no nonlinearity here, it's just counting. Nonlinearity only occurs uh, into the picture because uh, you start uh, from a distribution which is different from the equilibrium one, uh, the input of the fiber, and nonlinearity favor is like a collisions between uh, atoms in a, in a gas, exchanges energy between the modes. So 
by true four-way mixing, you have NHS change, uh, which lead to a redistribution of the original uh, uh, transient uh, distribution of energy in the modes uh, towards the, the really genes. So the higher the power, the faster is this convergence uh, to thermalization. The faster are the energy exchanges, which lead to the most likely distribution. So it's all, uh, it's all in this uh, single slide. And uh, again, this, this, this is a picture of how this mode look like. For a, uh, you can take a Laguerre-Gauss uh, mode base, and uh, there is a, uh, you can number the modes with two indices. One is the quantum number, uh, the one uh, uh, that uh, essentially determines for each, uh, which quantum number you have a degeneracy GI. So the first the fundamental mode, the GI, is one, and then two, three, and so on. So you have uh, all these modes uh, have the same uh, quantum number that is the same propagation constant, but different azimuthal index, different orbital angular momentum. And the main quantum number, so the, these uh, uh, LG modes, they have two indices, and the quantum number is determined by this simple formula from the two indices of the modes. Uh, uh, well, here is uh, just uh, some details how you, uh, I mean, uh, the, the only slide that is necessary to understand the concept, I concept is this one. Then if you want to uh, go into the details, then you can express uh, the conserved quantities, the Hamiltonian, as a function of the number of photons in each mode and the momentum of, that, uh, of those photons. And then uh, you conserve the number of particles, so the sum of the, the, the photons in all modes. And uh, the, the calculations are very simple in the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, and uh, you compute the partition function. And, uh, and from this one, uh, you obtain immediately the amber average number of particles in any given mode uh, by doing the integration of the partition function, which leads uh, to this religion's distribution. And then in, uh, explicitly, that's how the, the temperature and the chemical potential look like in this religion's distribution. Is it true or is it just a dream? So, well, uh, again, uh, I uh, just one slide to recall that the special self-imaging effect associated to the equispacing of the modes. And uh, that's something, again, uh, just to anticipate what I will say in a moment, you can actually visualize it because when you are in the very high energy regime, uh, when you get uh, this multi-photon uh, uh, absorption, uh, you excite, uh, you get up conversion of light uh, from the defects in the in a green fiber, which is doped by germanium, so, so there are some defects. And uh, at the points of maximum intensity, when the beam uh, becomes uh, more uh, compressed uh, in space, the intensity goes up and you generate uh, this fluorescence. So you can actually visualize all these uh, blue spots uh, uh, generated by the green fiber uh, where that uh, um, uh, associated with this uh, breathing of, of the special breathing of the beam. So how this uh, self, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, religion's distribution looks like, uh, so that is, uh, uh, that's why the, f you know, the, the beam is clean, because most of the energy is always in the fundamental mode, and then it goes down uh, uh, with an hyperbole, with uh, uh, this uh, uh, hyperbolic decrease. And uh, for uh, if the excitation is a symmetric, uh, you have a symmetric distribution uh, uh, around the, um, I mean, with respect to the azimuthal index, m equals zero, and uh, then uh, we implemented uh, an holographic method to actually measure the distribution. So measure uh, no the phase and the power in all the modes at the output of the fiber by using a, a, um, a special light modulator. So we could do a mode decomposition of the field at the output actually to, to verify that uh, this equilibrium distribution is, uh, is, is obtained. And uh, this is a result, uh, so it shows uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the power in the different modes as the power is, in uh, I mean, uh, the relative uh, power in the different modes as a function of input power. You see that the fundamental mode goes up, uh, and, the uh, and uh, there is a tendency of uh, so growth of the fundamental mode at the expense of the other modes. But then when you do actually a comparison, uh, the power goes up in this way. You see at low powers you have a distribution which is non-equilibrium one corresponding to speckles. And the red, uh, red curve is the Rayleigh genes distribution. You increase the power and you, you, you really approach at uh, maximum power the, uh, the equilibrium distribution with an with error that goes down.
So that is a confirmation that indeed uh, uh, this uh, thermodynamic approach is, uh, is really describing uh, what comes out. And, uh, and of course, uh, so what I'm showing here is the, the beam profile that goes from speckles to a clean beam uh, and the reconstruction using uh, uh, the result of the mode decomposition. This so just to confirm, uh, if they look the same, this means the reconstruction is correct. So it's just as a confirmation, uh, the second plot. And, uh, so we and of course, we confirmed not only that the distribution is the one that we expect, uh, so thi this also shows that the self-clean beam is, is in reality not uh, just a fundamental mode, but it has substantial energy, almost, uh, almost 40% in the higher order modes. Uh, just uh, the dominant one is the fundamental. And also we, cons we confirmed that, that uh, internal energy or Hamiltonian and the orbital angular momentum are conser uh, conserved. So we, that is a sanity check that the method works. Uh, uh, what happens if you introduce uh, some uh, beam which has an orbital angular momentum? I will go very quickly. I don't think I have uh, much time for that. Uh, well, it just uh, leads uh, to a symmetry breaking of the distribution. If you introduce an OAM, uh, then the distribution is no longer symmetric with respect to m equals zero. And, uh, so also we and, and we did experiment uh, to confirm that. So just believe me, I will not go into the details, but uh, uh, this uh, asymmetric distribution that is predicted by the theory in, pres in the presence of OEM, uh, it was also confirmed experimentally. And uh, also I would like to notice that uh, here is a thermalized beam but it doesn't look uh, clean. So in this case, uh, uh, it shows that uh, you can have a, a thermalized beam uh, that is an equilibrium beam distribution, which uh, does, necess does not necessarily have uh, a symmetric uh, a bell, shape, uh, bell shape. So the quality factor of this beam may not be high, but still it's thermalized. That is, uh, is absolutely stable if you move the fiber, whereas here you are out of equilibrium and you the, the, the speckles uh, move around. So the thermalization is, I would say, a more general concept uh, than, uh, than self-cleaning. So self-cleaning, you get it only in, in a specific uh, range of, uh, of input coupling conditions and, and powers. And how to generate, uh, how to seed this OAM beam? Okay, you can generate uh, orbital angular momentum beam by many ways, by some uh, lenses or uh, spatial light modulator, but there's a very simple way. Just inject uh, a laser with some tilt angle and then offset with respect to the axis, and then the beam uh, will uh, evolve along an helical propagation uh, in the fiber. And you can compute uh, the theoretical value of the average angular momentum of this beam is just a function of this, uh, uh, of this tilt and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the offset. So y0 and, and theta determine the orbital angular momentum. And that it is interesting that uns under some conditions uh, that I will quickly move, uh, describe in the following, uh, what comes out of from the fiber can, in at high power, can generate a supercontinuum that uh, distributes itself along the spiral. And in fact, th this effect uh, uh, results uh, from a combination of two effects, a sp sp spiral emission, that is a emission of a beam with the spiral-shaped intensity profile, which occurs also uh, at low powers. So even uh, we reproduced uh, this figure uh, with the helium, helium laser or even with the laser pointer like this. So you obtain a spiral beam with appropriate uh, coupling conditions. And uh, at high powers, there is a supercontinuum generation and uh, conic so-called conical emission, which occurs in free space, but also in multi-mode fibers or separation of colors. When you combine the two effects, you get uh, uh, what we call a rainbow-like uh, spiral profile. And this... Uh, uh, it, it can be achieved under different configurations. So uh, we uh, understand the, the spiral emission uh, as a, mm, a manifestation of a beam that carries an unconventional longitudinal orbital angular momentum that is uh, an angular momentum that uh, varies uh, uh, not linearly with the azimuthal angle, but uh, non-linearly with the power of the azimuthal angle. So that is the, the phase of the beam uh, varies with a certain integer power of phi, where uh, phi is the azimuthal angle. And uh, we have, uh, there are two ways uh, to generate uh, these helical beams in the fiber, either by coupling uh, the beam into the cladding. So that is, uh, 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 what we have here is a simulation, and that is the experiment uh, that confirms it. Or you can 
uh, uh, and you, jet, uh, you, you obtain a helica plasma filament plus uh, spiral emission, or you can get it also coupling uh, the, uh, in a graded index fiber uh, the beam in the core. So you can couple in the cladding, so the beam, of course, the in the cladding it expands, but it, it moves uh, uh, along to a uh, helicoidal trajectory. And it can also uh, move with a helicoidal trajectory if you couple it into the cladding, and you get also a helical plasma filament at suffi sufficient high powers. So again, to connect uh, this uh, uh, with the plasma theory, what, uh, what we have observed uh, with these uh, helicoidal beams, uh, uh, so plasma is uh, typically uh, observed in uh, propagation in free space of laser beams. It acts as a, uh, uh, just associated with the ionization of air, and uh, it acts as a divergent uh, lens, so it tends to, to broaden the beam, and, uh, but the care effects tend to self-focus the beam, so the two effects can uh, balance each other, so it's like a spatial soliton that is formed, and uh, you can have uh, the, uh, what is what the, 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 the equivalent of the special soliton is uh, what is known as a plasma filament. And uh, uh, of course, it can also lead uh, so be associated to supercontinuum generation. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, generally this uh, plasma filaments uh, go straight. And in a fiber, uh, it's interesting because you can, using by using this ge geometry uh, cylindrical geometry of the fiber, you can uh, produce uh, plasma filaments that are curved, that, that move around. So there are many applications of, uh, uh, of a plasma for uh, uh, material ma modifications. For you can generate, uh, you can because you can modify uh, by ionization the material. So you can write uh, a break grating or a waveguide that moves helicoidally uh, in the fiber. The you can use them as an optical tweezer to trap uh, particles for micro machining and, and so on. So there are many applications, and uh, and again also by solving the uh, the 3D plus 1 or linear Schrodinger equation in, in space, it's just a special effect. We confirmed uh, uh, the how these plasma filaments are, uh, uh, we reproduced the generation of these plasma filaments both in graded index and in step index fibers. And there are some uh, um, uh, differences, for example, the, the pitch of this helix doesn't change uh, uh, when you change the injection conditions in graded index fiber, whereas in step index fiber, the period changes when you, when you change uh, the, the coupling conditions. So there are some uh, detailed differences. And, uh, and again, uh, the, the nice thing is that we can visualize these plasma filaments, again, because of uh, uh, this luminescence uh, that is associated uh, to the presence of uh, uh, defects. For example, even in uh, silicon, uh, pure silicon fiber, there are some... Uh, uh, defects uh, called uh, known as non bridging, bridging oxygen hole centers, um, which emit uh, in the red 650 nanometers, and uh, and so you have uh, you start from uh, uh, near infrared 1030 laser, uh, you absorb uh, several photons, you go to this excited state, which then decays, and uh, you have uh, the emission of this uh, this luminescence. Uh, which enables you to, to, to visualize the, the plasma filament as a red uh, beam. And similarly, in uh, germanium, you have a germanium, in, I'm sorry, in graded index fiber, you have germanium doping, uh, which has, a, uh, and in germanium, there are other type of defects, which now radiate at 400 uh, nanometers, so it looks more bluish, the light. And uh, so you start uh, from a self-imaging, you see only a certain number of fluorescence at uh, bright spots and then you increase the power and all the spots are connected into a, uh, and you get a self-channeling uh, plasma filament uh, by connecting all the spots along this helo helicoidal trajectory. And uh, so, okay, these are just uh, some details of the characterization of this uh, multi-photon absorption process. I will move, uh, I think it's time to move to conclusions. And uh, so in the uh, re regime of weak nonlinearity, uh, I think uh, one uh, key result is that we have uh, validated uh, uh, the description of this uh, surprising uh, beam self-cleaning effect uh, as a, a manifestation of uh, classical wave thermalization and uh, demonstrated by holographic mode decomposition techniques leading to this uh, uh, religion's equilibrium mode power distribution, verified the conservation laws and uh, generalized to beams with orbital angular momentum. And in a strong nonlinearity regime, uh, we have uh, unveiled uh, 
many cases by chance, uh, but just uh, uh, seeing what happened and then understanding, of course, the physics behind. Uh, several novel effects uh, which occur in this extreme uh, soft breakdown regime, like uh, the presence of a strong multi-photon absorption and upconversion luminescence, spiral beam generation, rhyme rainbow supercontinuum. Actually, this image uh, uh, was uh, Wayne Knox from Rochester University liked it so much, so Optica took it as a uh, the icon of uh, Nolinar Optics Conference in Hawaii uh, next year. Uh, so if anybody wants to go to Hawaii, uh, this, this is not from uh, some uh, Hawaiian uh, painting, it's actually from our lab. And uh, so helica helical plasma filament generation, and uh, uh, we, be, uh, we are now working on applications of these effects uh, for uh, tweezers and uh, uh, also uh, multi-photon microscopy and endoscopy. Uh, try to use this for something useful. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> I'm sorry if I was going too fast. Uh, nobody <laughs> interrupted me for a question. So now, please. Okay, uh, now it's time for questions or comments. Okay, one question over there. No, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Correct me if I didn't understand correctly. Uh, this orbital angular momentum, like if you can separate it in time, I was just wondering if you know any application like in uh, sensing particles or something when where you might have like improvement of temporal resolution, or something like that could happen. Well, you 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 can, uh, as I said, uh, one idea is to use uh, for tweezers, uh, so using the orbital angular momentum for trapping particles, uh, uh, in uh, and, and imparting to them an orbital angular momentum by using light. More questions. So Yes, it could have applications in sensing as well, yes. Yeah, more questions? Yes. <coughs> Thank you very much for your nice talk. And <coughs> I, I was listening when you were talking about uh, the difference between the solitons in a standard single mode fiber and the solitons in a in a multimode fiber. Uh, you were pointing that uh, you need a specific time duration. Right. I'm wondering if you need also a specific power. And in that case, how, how is that the soliton is stable? If you need to fix both time and power, it looks like it should be quite unstable. No, it is uh, stable in the sense that it's like an attractor. It behaves like in a dissipative system. In a dissipative system, you have an attractor. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the soliton ca that comes from a fiber laser is uh, called dissipative soliton, and it has a fixed duration and power. Of course, uh, when you couple into the fiber, you, you send much more power, and uh, the excess power will be dissipated into dispersive waves, or maybe you generate many of these solitons. But just uh, saying that w what comes out from the fiber, it has a specific uh, time duration and power. Yeah, power yeah. But if you have uh, twice the power, maybe you, you generate uh, two solitons, each with that. Uh, so a pair of solitons, a multiplet. There was another question here. Ah, yeah. Uh, I have two questions only to repass a uh, concept. Can you repeat uh, what I which importance have the potential chemical uh, chemistry and the modes of Laguerre La Gauss, please? Uh, Laguerre Gauss are the modes of the multimode fiber. The importance of the modes Laguerre Gauss, please. Can you repeat which importance is in modes, please? Well, uh, they, you, uh, these are the, in the linear conditions, these are the the modes are supported by the fiber, so you, they are an, an orthonormal basis and you can express the guided field as a uh, linear superposition of those modes. So th there are different families. Uh, there is a so Laguerre Gauss is the most used for, uh, okay. there are also Hermit Gauss modes. You can use another basis. 
And the other question is about the potential chemical. Can you repeat which importance have in the, mm, in the fibers? Well, the, the chemical potential. Again, the temperature, chemical potential are, uh, uh, are uh, optical parameters which uh, uh, are determined, uh, are uh, s associated to the equilibrium distribution. So you can only determine them uh, a posteriori based on the, on the distribution that you observe. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, they have a just, uh, in fact, they have, a they have a physical meaning, but again, associated with a statistical description of the mode population. They have nothing to do with uh, a chemical potential and temperature of, uh, of a gas or uh, associated with the collisions between particles. Th okay, thank you. Yeah, any other question? So thank you for, for the talk, Professor Warnitz. I have a, a couple of questions regarding the, the beam self-cleaning. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that uh, the non-linearity, the forward mixing, uh, has not uh, an essential, a crucial role for getting this kind of evolution? No, it has, uh, maybe, uh, the equilibrium distribution uh, is determined uh, just by probabilistic considerations. Yeah. So that, uh, the linearity does not determine the, the final result. So d does it mean that a system, sorry. Yes. It just determines the length scale over which thermalization occurs because it favors exchange between, uh, okay. uh, between the modes. So because you start from a different distribution, so you need to shake uh, somehow okay. to, to so make the modes uh, talk to each other, to transfer energy, to arrive to another distribution. Does it mean that for uh, an optical system with a high enough number of modes with other types of non-linearities, this type of evolution would still yes, uh, sure, be observed? Sure. Yes. Okay. In fact, uh, yes, you can observe with any non-linearity, even if you had a, a quadratic non-linearity, you would observe okay. it. And my second question is uh, actually about the, you, you mentioned that, okay, the, the, the evolution of the system is thermodynamic, so the Qualitatively speaking, the disorder is increasing. However, when looking at beam, uh, beam self-cleaning, one would say that, well, the order is somehow increasing, right? So could you please, I'm not, I do, I'm not sure if I'm wrong, but it's like if, if the energy is, is accumulating in only one, one mode. No, one well precisely, it's a distribution. So most of the entropy is actually in the higher order modes, in the tail of the distribution. Okay. So even in the limit where you have 99% in the fundamental mode, but still you have uh, this 1% uh, in, in 99 higher order modes which have uh, uh, high entropy. So and it's that contribution yes, which, which increases yes, the yes, entropy. Yeah, right, right. Okay, thank you. I have a question myself regarding these this orbital momentum uh, experiments. Uh, yeah. Does the circular polarization play a role there? Because you would have like a total uh, uh, momentum, right? You have the orbital one plus the spin from the photon. Does it play a role or not? Well, it, yeah, it's a different type of angular momentum. So we are also studying uh, polarization effects in self-cleaning. We are studying them and uh, we find uh, some uh, like eigenstates. Uh, some for some polarization states, uh, uh, self-cleaning uh, occurs uh, earlier. For others, it occurs later. So there is clearly polarization dependence, but uh -huh. uh, so it's quite uh, still uh, we not understand uh, what's <laughs> going on. I mean, it's quite complex. We have a paper on that. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes. <laughs> so um, one could say that the most important feature of the system is uh, for this particular behavior and description is this property of its equidistance between mm -hmm. with energy right. modes, so which is basically the optical analog of a harmonic oscillator, a right. two-dimensional yes. harmonic oscillator. So I guess that there are some properties, including uh, statistics properties, that ca somehow will be common to, to both. I don't know if, for well example... In, in fact, uh, uh, the, um, again, uh, this, uh, okay, the waveguide structure uh, enters into determining the modes, but the equidistance of the modes, uh, where it really is important, is because uh, it's e when the modes are all equidistant, uh, it's easier to phase match uh, uh, for when mixing terms. There yeah. are many, f m f m and also the energy exchange is more efficient. That's why you, you see this uh, self-cleaning in graded index fibers, but if you have a step index fiber, you could observe it, but. Uh, 
uh, over much longer length or much higher power where maybe you destroy the power. That's why nobody has observed it in a, in a step index fiber so, so far. Okay. The second question is related to orbital angular momentum because in your system orbital angular momentum is concerned because of the symmetry of the... Mm -hmm. because you, you use a fiber which has rotational symmetry right. and the type of nonlinearity curve preserves mm -hmm. this condition in propagation. Yes. So my question is have you studied what happens when you use discrete rotational symmetry and then the spectrum, the angular spectrum will change? It won't uh, be exactly the same? Uh, sorry, with what kind of symmetry? You take a gradient uh, fiber but not with full rotational symmetry, like hexagonal uh, one. No, no, that's interesting. Uh, no, we didn't study that. Because, because then I mean the distribution, it will change. So mm. my, I don't know, the statistical properties sure, will well you, know, you cannot different. impose the, the conservation anymore. Uh, then sure. Then you have one, one conservation less. Yeah. So it's the an distribution will be different. It's an open question then? Yes, yes. No, and we never studied that. It's an interesting, very interesting okay. point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And in fact, there are also these uh, square fibers, which are chaotic and... Uh, it would ah. be very interesting to study okay, okay. self-cleaning effects. I see, I see. That's good. Uh, any other question or comment? If not, please, let's give a hand again to our <laughs> speaker <laughs> today. And for people of my